Okay, let's start. We're going to continue with optimization. And we already did example one. So optimization, basically making something as big as possible or as small as possible within some restriction to make our lives better. Um, so again, there's a handout. You should have the handout. If not, you can print it again from the website. We're going to do example two. So it says design an open design an open rectangular box with square ends, the left and the right side and square. Having a volume of 36 cubic inches, that minimizes the amount of materials for construction. Right? We want to save the earth. So basically, remember our steps with optimization. Um, step one is to read. Make sure you read so you know what you want to maximize or minimize and what your restrictions are. Draw um, Draw a picture. So here they told us the picture is a box. Right? And I know the top is open. So let's, let's see that. We also know that the ends are square, which means that whatever width this is, that's your height. And then this could be something else, like a Y. So that's our picture. Now I'm told that the volume is 36. What does that mean? Okay, so. That brings us to step three, which means to find our constraint equation and our objective equation. Okay, let's start with constraint. What's our constraint here? Your volume is 36. The volume, right? Constraint is going to be the guy that they give you a value for, right? So this is always what they give you a value for. Because once they give you a value, that's automatically a restriction, right? The volume can't be whatever you want. It has to be 36, right? So that's your restriction. That's how much space this box can take up, 36 cubic units, right? So whatever you're given a, a value for, that's your constraint. So our, our constraint here is actually our volume equation. And what's the volume of this box? Length times width times height. Length times width times height. So it's going to be x squared times y. And that, we're told, is 36. So this guy here is your constraint equation. Now you're going to talk about the objective equation. Put this under. OK, so what's our objective here? What do we want to minimize or maximize? Maximize the possible area. Minimize. Want to minimize the amount of materials. In other words, the area of the spaces, right? So the objective here is to minimize surface area. How do you find surface area? Well, you basically add up all the all the areas of each side, and then you just add them up. Right. So there, this side is x squared plus the area of the left side same thing x squared the area of the back um, you might as well just write 3xy because x times y plus x times y plus x times y well the back is xy mm -hmm. the front is xy um, there's no top there are only two xy's no no, uh, the, 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 bottom, the bottom the bottom even though there's no top so we end up with what? 2x squared plus 3x plus 3xy. And that is our objective equation. Now, what was the next step? Right, so this was our restriction, the volume. We have to find the variance. Right? This was the objective, the area, right? And we want to minimize that guy. What do we have to do now? Solve for find, the min the, find the minimum. Solve for one guy here, plug it into this guy here, because this has two variables, and we don't have to differentiate some of the two variables. So basically, I'm going to go with the constraint, right? Mm -hmm. So now I know that I'd solve for y is 36 over x squared. This means my a would be equal to 
32x squared plus 3x times 36 over x squared. And then the x's can kill each other. So this two x's kill each other, and I have 2x squared plus, um, what's 3 times 36? It's, it's like 108 or something. 108 over x. That's my area. Right, so now I have the objective equation in one variable, brings me to step five, which is? Find the absolute maximum. You need to find a maximum or a minimum, right? Because we want to actually find a minimum here. We know we are minimizing, so we want a minimum value. How do we get that? Take the derivative. Find the derivative. That's going to be 4x minus 108 over x squared. And so for critical points, you need your a prime equals 0 or undefined. Obviously undefined is not going to work, it's undefined when x is 0 and if the side length is 0 we don't have a box. So we're just worried about where a prime is 0. And so we have 4x minus 108 over x squared equals 0. How do I solve that equation? Um. <coughs> You subtract 4x on both sides? Um, sure, you can do that. Remove the 108. Then? Negative. Negative 108. Negative 108. You move I the 108. Oh, sorry. <coughs> then? Go. Then what? The x squared times 4x. Multiply by x squared. Gives us what? No problem, solve this. Uh, uh. <laughs> algebra, right? Remember, I told you guys the hardest part of calculus is the algebra. This is what you guys get stuck on. Um, yeah, like right here, I would have just multiplied through by the LCD. You get 4x cubed minus 108, bring that over, divide by 4, take the cube root. Um, and you have that. So, anyway, x is 3. What were we asked for? How did you get negative 108 over next? You did the product rule. Mm -hmm. Product rule? Like the derivative. I took the derivative. How would you find the derivative of this? You bring the x up as it is. Bring the x up. 3 does 108x to the minus 1 do the power rule. Quotient rule is a waste of time. The top is a constant. Don't do the quotient rule of the denominator or the numerator as a constant. You rewrite it and use the power rule for the chain. All right, so we know that x equals 3. What were we asked for here? Oh, they said design an open box. So I guess here we just tell them the dimensions that we want. Um, so since x equals 3, we know that our y value must be what? Well, y. y is equal to? 2, and then literally everywhere you see x, plug in a 3, and then solve for y. Well, what is y? <coughs> 4. Where are you getting that? Here, y is 36 over x squared. So this is going to be 36 over 3 squared, which is 36 over 9, right? Which is 4. So. The box is a three by three by four. Four by three by three or three by three by four box. 
Right? And obviously the side, the side is square, so this is the, the height and the width, and that will be the length. So that is the box that will have the volume of 36, and it will use the least amount of materials. As you can see, we went through the same process, read the problem. Two was to draw a diagram, which we drew here. Three was to figure out these two equations. Four is to solve for one variable here, plug it into there. Five is to differentiate, and then find the maximum or the minimum, right, which is, comes from the critical points. And after that, you can answer whatever problem, whatever question they ask you. Um, so just as easily, they could have asked you for what is the actual area of the materials? In which case, once I find x equals 3, I would really just plug in 3 into this equation, and I can say that's the area. Right? So they could have asked you for something else, so you have to be careful that you give them what they asked for. Let's go through another one. So what's the mean difference between finding, maximizing and minimizing? When, like, the first problem we did, we wanted to maximize, and then we're minimizing. Um, there's no difference. The difference is going to happen here, right? Find the critical point. You're going to want the critical point that gives you the minimum value, as opposed to the maximum value. Turns out that 3 did it. If you actually did the first derivative test here, and you're at a 3, it turns out that you'd be decreasing and then increasing. Whereas in another situation, you'd be doing the opposite. Right, so the maximum and minimum, it all happens in step five. You pick whichever one you actually need. Wait, Yeah, like in this case, they said minimize something, right? So I know that when I find a critical point, I'm going to want to find the minimum one, as opposed to the maximum one. Okay, here's another one. So that was actually from a final. That was from the 2010 final. Um, from the fall to a night final, here's another problem. A rectangular corral of 162 square meters is to be fenced off and then divided by a fence into two sections as shown in the figure. So here they actually gave you the picture. Right, so in example three. So one we were reading. Two, they actually gave us a picture. Right, so this is a fence, and they cut it in two, in two by a, another fence through the middle. Right? Find the dimensions of the corral so that the amount of fencing is minimized. Right? So I want to find the dimensions of this guy so that I use the least amount of fencing given, what do I know? What was I given here? 162 meters square, the area? The area, right? So I know that the area that this covers is 162 square meters. Right? So the area of this whole thing is 162. Right? So 3. I'm going to find my objective, objective and constraint equations. Let's start with the constraint. That's usually the easiest one to find. So let's start there. What's x, what's y? The area. Um, um. Right, so they gave you the picture, but they didn't label it. You're going to have to label it yourself. So let's say we call this x and call that height y, right? And so now I know that area is just x times y, which they gave us a value for that, 162. So that's my constraint equation, okay? Now let's move on to the objective equation. What is the thing we want to maximize or minimize? We want to minimize the amount of fencing needed. Okay, so, so what is the amount of fencing? as in relation to this figure. 2x plus 2y, or is it 3y, considering it's split in the middle? 3y. Right. This, this is a part of the fencing, right? So that's a y, this is a y, and then this whole thing is another x. Right, the amount of fencing is the perimeter of this thing. So the objective is going to be perimeter, which in this case is 2x plus 3y. Okay, what was that for? So, uh, we solve for, uh, so for one, the y and the constraint, and plug it into the objective. Right, so we're going to use this, solve for one of the variables, then we're going to plug it into here. Who do you want to solve for? Doesn't really matter. Um, 
you could solve for the X or the Y. Um, usually I'd solve for the one that where you can replace the guy with the smallest number, but I don't, the two and the two and the three, I don't think it matters. <laughs> so we have this 162 over X, that's my Y, which means my perimeter function is the same as 2X plus 3 times 162 over X. Right? So 3 times 162 is a little bit more annoying than finding 2 times 162, but whatever. Um, so 2X plus, what's that? Coming in? 486. That's my P. Now that I have my function for the perimeter, I want to find the derivative. I want to find the minimum point. So to do that for a function, I need to find the derivative. Right, so I'm going to find P prime. It's going to be 2 minus 486 over x squared. And so I'm going to find the critical points here. This means P oh. prime equals zero or undefined. The undefined one is not practical. It's undefined when X equals zero, which means I have no corral. So I'm going to worry about P prime equals zero. So I have a bunch of fractions in an equation. I multiply through by the LCD. So I'm going to multiply by X squared. And then I have 2x squared equals 486. And so x squared would be that divided by 2, which is going to be what? 243. 243. Mm -hmm. And so my x is just the radical of 243. It's plus or minus, but we ignore the minus, obviously, because we're talking about a length. Is that a nice thing? Mm -hmm. 15.5 Yeah, Yeah, so it's not a nice number. Um, can I divide 3 into it? What do I get if I divide 3? 81. 81, right? So this is just 9 radical 3. So I know it wasn't divisible by 2, the next number is 3. And you know that a number is divisible by 3 if the sum of the digits is divisible by 3. Right? So 2 plus 4 plus 3 is actually 9, which is divisible by 3. So I know 243 was divisible by 3. And got, yeah, I got 81. Are there rules for all of those numbers? Like, yeah, there's a rule for divisibility for a lot of numbers. Yeah. Um, so 9. what did they ask us for? Minimize the amount of fence you No, need. they said find the dimensions to minimize. So basically they want me to tell them x and y. So I just found x. Right, so since x is 9 radical 3, what do we have for y? Plug it in. I know that y was 162 divided by x. Um, does 9 go into 162? Okay, and how many times? How many times? 18. 18 times? What? 9 goes into 16, 1 time, remainder 7, so you put the 7 here, 9 goes into 72, 8 times, so you get 18. So that's my Y. So the corral has dimensions um, 9 radical 3 by 18 over radical 3. Length times width. That's the length, that's the width. So that's, that's important, that you, that's your final answer. How do you check that? Like, like if you check, like, you take it test, you set against each other, so ourselves. How do we check it? Like, then we check it to see if we get the same answer. Uh, check, check what? The, the final answer here? Yeah. Do you, you check the area? Like, you're, you're, like checking a little on one side and a little on the other, and your area will 
Yeah, well, of course, if you multiply this by that, you should get 162. Yeah, because other than that, there's cancel out and nine times eighteen is one sixty two again. Yeah. Um, as well as you just have to make sure the number kind of makes sense. You know what you're. So you know you shouldn't get negative numbers or anything crazy like that. But as for the actual value, it's it's kind of hard to check. Then you've done just like you test the. You could do a second derivative test on that and find. Oh, you would have done it here. Right, so you test this x value. So you could do a first or test or, or, or otherwise. You would hear that this was a minimum. I'd usually skip it though. Usually, if you only get one possible answer, that has to be the answer. So. Um, example four. One, three. Okay. A cylindrical can without a top is to be made to hold 8,000 pi cubic meters of liquid. Find the dimensions of the can, which will minimize the amount of material needed to make the can. That is, minimize the surface area of the can. Okay. What do we do? 8,000 pi is the amount of Well, we read. What was the next thing we should do? Draw a picture. Draw a picture. What are we looking at? Cylinder. No top. All right. Now, what's the? If we're talking about dimensions, what are we talking about for a cylinder? Isn't it pi r squared times h? Right. What I want to get at is what variables we're using. H would be one, the height of the can, and the radius. Right. If you tell me the height and the radius, I can describe. I know exactly what size the can should be. Right. So that's our picture. Um, three. So we're going to find the constraint. What is our constraint here? What? Volume. How do I know it's volume? Because it's cubic, right? So things like in, in, in these problems, you, things like units you have to pay attention to. So it's like in the previous problem, they said 162 square meters. Square meters means areas is the, is, the, is the thing we're looking at. If they have cubic, that means it's volume. If they just have meters, that would be length, right? So things like that you should pay attention to. That's why you should read very carefully, right? So here they said cubic meters, which means they're telling me about a volume, right? So now I know the volume of a right cylindrical can. What is it? Pi r squared h, right? So the volume of any prism is the, the volume of the base times the, the height. Okay, and that we know is 8,000 pi. In which case I can kind of simplify this, divide both sides by pi, and I get r squared h is just 8,000. That's my constraint equation. Now what about my objective? What do we want to minimize? Surface area. How do we find the surface area of this thing? Isn't just the area of the circle? No. What about the sides? Area of two circles and the the radius of uh, the circumference of the sides times the height. Uh, circumference of the circle times the height. Yeah. So in general, if you have a can. And this is a very common object to talk about. You kind of dissect it, right? There are two circles for the top and the bottom, right? But in this case, I, I believe they said there was no top. Right? So we're not even considering this. And then there's a side here, which, is which basically right? comes from when you take the cylinder and you slice it down and you unravel it, the length around the top is going to be the circumference, right? Which is 2 pi r, right? And then the height is h. So if I take the area here, this is pi r squared. The area here is just a height length times height. So it's 2rh is the area. And so now the area that I'm looking at is going to just be the area of this guy, pi r squared, plus the area of the side, which is 2 pi rh. And if it had a top, it would be two of these guys, but we don't have a top. 
Wait, can't you theoretically solve for H since since that original was a cylinder and circum and, and circumference equals two pi r? Yeah. So that would mean H is just R. No, H doesn't. Have to do that. Then like uh, H doesn't have to be R. Though. You can stretch and pull that can in any direction and still get that R. Anyway, this is my objective, right? What's the next step? Solve for someone here, plug it into that guy. Who do we solve for? The H, because I don't want to have to take a radical, right? So I'm going to be here, I'm going to have H is equal to 8,000 over R squared, which means that my A would be pi r squared plus 2 pi r times h, which is 8,000 over r squared. This r will cancel one of those r's. So my a is pi r squared plus pi times 16,000 over r. Now if I take a prime, which is the next step, so we're on step five now. I'm going to find the derivative because I need to find the minimum. How do I find the derivative? Well, that's actually the... It's a constant of the variable. What's the derivative of this? Derivative of pi zero. Yeah, sure. So it's two well, r. Two r. Two r plus. Two pi r plus. Right. If I had like um, three x squared, what would is the derivative? Right. The three stays there, and you take the derivative of that. Are we seeing why I throw weird things on my tests every now and then? Because you get to here, where it's a very practical thing, but it looks crazy. What's happening with that pi? Right? You need to understand. It's just a constant times r squared. Right? Don't be scared by how it looks. The same rules still apply. Right? What about this one? Negative. Negative 16,000 pi over r squared. Right? Once you get past how scary something looks, it's, it's not so bad. You just apply the rule. And so now, find the critical points. Two pi r, sixteen thousand pi over r squared equals zero. Right. So it's zero or undefined, but the undefined would give us r equals zero. We wouldn't have this, so we know that this is where we're going to find our critical points. That might look scary, but it's a fraction. What do I do with any fraction in an equation? Multiply by the LCD. It doesn't matter how scary it looks. So I'm going to multiply by r squared. I'm going to get 2 pi r cubed minus 16,000 pi equals 0. Move this guy over there. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2 pi. I will kill each other. Two goes into this eight times. That was right. So now this means that r cubed is eight thousand. So my r is going to be what? The cube root of eight thousand, which is R is just 20 um, inches or meters or whatever. And so, what were we asked for dimensions? Find the dimensions, right? So now I know what my radius is. So my radius is 20, which means that my height is 
8,000 over 4 meters squared, right? Which is going to be what? 8,000 over 400, but then it'll be like 80 over 4, 1,000 over 400. So 80 over 4 is also 20. So my h is 20. So those are my dimensions. Radius equals 20, height equals 20. Hmm. Short of a clock. Yeah. Yes. How do you get plus with that one? And with the area? I'm adding the areas. Okay. It's the area of the, the bottom yeah. circle plus the area of the side. So I add them together. Okay. I dissected the can into pieces. And then, um, okay. so the idea is like you make a cam, but you take a rectangle and you really just connect it end to end, right? That's how you make a cam. And then the distance around here is the circumference, and then that's the height. So when you unravel it, this length here is the circumference, that's the height. So I get this rectangle here. And so I take the area of this plus the area of that, that is my area function, and then I go through the method with the area function. Any other questions? So with the critical point, um, you know it's either maximum and minimum just because there's one, just one answer to the critical yeah. point? Mm -hmm. okay. So at this point, if you find one answer, just assume that's your answer, remember. Um, we would leave our final answer, like dimensions. This would be the final answer. We would leave it just like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the only... The only time I, I recommend you testing things is if you got several answers. Like I got R equals 20 and R equals 40, then you're going to be like, which one's the minimum? Right? So then you'd actually do a test. But if you get one answer, just assume that's the answer. So the process is always the same. As you can see, the only things that are changing is the objective and constraint equations that we're working on, basically. And whether or not we want to find a maximum or a minimum. Um, so let's see here. The manager of a department store wants to build a 600-foot rectangular enclosure in the store's parking lot. Three sides of the enclosure would be built of redwood fencing. The cost is $14 per running foot. The fourth side is with cement blocks. Cost $28 per running foot. Find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the building materials. Right? So this guy wants to build a display, and but you know it costs money to build that display. You want to pay the least amount of money. Okay, so this was taken from a final, but I believe there's a typo. I think that 600 foot should be square feet. Area? Yeah, like an area. Right? Like saying a 600 foot rectangle. Enclosure makes long sense for square feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a typo on this final. Because that 600, you're like, what would that 600 be? It could be the perimeter. Yeah, but you wouldn't describe an enclosure by... No, it would be area. That's, it's kind of weird to describe it that way. Yeah, 600 foot, that would be, if you consider that perimeter, I think that would be kind of weird. I don't know, let's see. This question is pretty similar. Hmm? This question is pretty similar, because if that's the case, just skip the uh, shit. I want you guys to try the one on your own, though. Which one? Question six and seven.
Question seven is tricky, so I, I wanted you guys to try that. Um, question six. It's also a cost problem. So we could... Um, Just do seven. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do seven. I want you guys to try seven. So I'm thinking, do I, we just pretend that it's area in problem five, or, or maybe pretend it's perimeter? Or we can do problem six instead. I only want to do one of them. <laughs> which, which do you think we would see? Like a six or harder problem? Uh, yeah, slightly. D6. We can do six. Yeah, I have to make sure that five is not a typo. Because it's kind of weird that they tell me perimeter there. I'm pretty sure it's area. With perimeter, there will be too many questions. Because then you don't know do you want to maximize the area while minimizing the cost, or, or what? Yeah, so I, I feel like I feel like it has to be area because then you'll have all the information you need. But anyway, I'll, I'll double check. Um, let's go to sticks. What did you say? Redwood fencing is overrated. Yes, yeah. redwood fencing. Okay, so let's let's go to the storage shed. I guess during the spring of 2009, redwood fencing was kind of popular. Yeah. A storage shed is to be built in the shape of a box with a square base. The volume is 300 cubic feet. There's a concrete base. The cost is $8 per square foot. The materials for the roof cost $4 per square foot. And the materials for the sides cost $5 per square foot. Find the dimensions of the most economical shed. Right, so you want to build a shed that holds 300 cubic feet of, of space. You have the cost for the floor, the sides, and the roof. And you want to make the cost as small as possible. You want, you want to be cheap. So let's actually do that. So one, we write the problem, because we need to figure out what do we want to do. All right, so I want to build a shed, which is going to be a rectangle. We don't know if it's a square, so we won't assume it is. Um, but I, I do know the base is concrete. Right? The roof is some other material, and the sides is some other materials. So I know that this guy here costs... $4. Oh, we are told that there's a square base. So this would be x, that would be x, this would be y. Now the roof... Let's pull out the information here. $4. The roof costs $4 per square foot. So this is $4 per square foot to build that. The concrete base $8. is $8 per square foot. And the sides is $5 per square foot. Right? So that's the cost to, to build this thing. Right? But I know I want my volume to be 300 cubic feet. So let's do uh, 300. So step three. So what are my equations? What's my constraint here? Your volume. Volume is the constraint. What is volume in this case? X squared Y. X squared times Y must be 300. So that's my constraint equation. Now what is my objective? Um, what? No? Remember, we're going to read the question. What is it that we want to minimize or maximize? That's always the objective. You find the dimensions of the most economical shares. So that means... Most economical means what? Minimize. Le uh, uh, minimize, minimize the surface area. Cost. cost is what you want to minimize. Economics is money. Well, how do you minimize the cost of the shed? Use the least amount of materials. It's not a matter of the least amount, because the different materials cost different amounts. 
but using uh, less of whichever materials will still uh, will still involve minimizing the cost. Yeah, but the thing is, using less of one would mean using more of the other if you want to maintain a certain volume, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like, so you can you make minimize? this. I mean, the roof, the air, the the surface here, the roof does not change as to regardless of the height of the shed. I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. The fact that it's different materials makes it bad. If it was all uniform, if it was all the same material, then yeah, minimizing the surface area is exactly the same as minimizing cost. Mm -hmm. But here, because the materials are different, the costs are different, I just go straight after cost, right? Yeah. We want most economical, we want to minimize cost. In other words, my cost function is going to be my objective. Now, how do I find the cost function? Hmm. It's, well, it's cost is going to be the cost for the roof, plus the cost for the, the base, plus the, plus, the plus the cost for the sides. Right? So let's focus on the roof. It's going to be literally 4x squared. 4x squared, right? The area of the roof is x squared, x times x. And then for each of those, it's 4 is the cost, plus the base. The base is again for x squared, but the base costs eight dollars. Plus, what's the sides? I know there are four sides, right? And they each cost five dollars, and the area is going to be x y x times y. So my cost function is going to be twelve x squared plus twenty x y. So what's the next step? Solve. Solve for one guy here, plug it into this guy here. So we know that y is equal to 300 over x squared, which means my cost function can be written as 12x squared plus x times 300 over x squared. And this cancels out. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, let's see. What is that? 6,000 over x. Fifth step is to find the critical points so I can know where the minimum is. So I'm going to find derivative. Derivative of this is. Where's one up? Um, so now we're going to have 24x cubed minus 6,000 equals 0. This means x cubed equals 6,000 divided by 24. Um, does that go into it exactly? You can just like keep reducing by two or four until you get down to that. So that's two fifty. So x is going to be the cube root of two fifty. Which is going to be five rep, five cube root of ten or something. Like that. Yeah, it's like six. Some that was something crazy. Um, so that's my x. What were we asked to find? Find the dimensions of the most economical shape. Okay, so dimensions mean I need to find the length and the width and the height. So this gives me the width and the length. So the height is what I need. 
This means that y is equal to 300 over x squared. So this means my y is going to be 300 over 25 times the cube root of 100. 25 goes into 300 how many times? 60. Because twenty goes, because uh, because five goes into one hundred twenty times, and we have three hundred, so twenty, forty, sixty. Yeah. Three hundred. Oh. Did you? You got sixty quarters to make three dollars. <laughs> 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 well. <laughs> yes, that's a that's a good. How many quarters does it take to make three dollars? Yeah, say 25 into 30 goes 1 time, the remainder is 5, 25 into 50 goes 2 times, so it's 12. And so, finally, dimensions, it's going to be 5 cube root 10 by 5 cube root 10 by 12. <laughs> right. It's clear that this is the base because we're told it's a square base, so you, obviously this is the length and the width and that's the height. So when you actually construct these things, they get a cubicle to the back of us to make a little Yeah. Or um What's typical now, it's you'd have someone who programmed it, this in a computer model, right? But if you're, you're doing something that's never been done before, this is the kind of analysis you go through. So, but people build rectangular structures all the time, so they have this built in somewhere into some Excel program or something. But then if you want to build some curved structure with some fancy design, you're going to start putting it into pieces together like this. Yeah, so there's that last part here. I said, how would things change if the last sentence asked, what is the cost to build the most economical share? So the actual problem ended right there, but I added this problem for you guys to think about. Right? So that's the answer to the dimensions, but I said, how would things change if the last sentence asks, what is the cost? Wouldn't we just go back to the original cost function and function? Go, go back to the original cost function and function, function x. So, um, so this is a totally separate problem here. If we were asked for cost, then after getting the fact that x was 5 times the cube root of 10, what we would have done, we wouldn't have done this. I would just go back to the cost function, which I know is this guy. Since c equals 12x squared plus 6,000 over x. So if they ask me for the cost, I wouldn't tell them the dimensions. I wouldn't need to know what the y value is at all. I'll just go back to my cost function and plug in this x value. This means that cost would have to be in dollars 12 times 5 to the 10 over plus 6,000 over 5 to the 10. And that would be whatever. And that would have been your answer. Right, so based on what the last sentence says, your answer can be completely different. That's why you have to make sure you read and, and, and pay attention to exactly what they're asking for. Did they ask for dimensions or did they ask for the cost or did they ask for, they could have asked for what, how tall should the structure be? In which case, your answer would be the y value. Right, That's, that would be what you box, right? Or something like that.
So, any questions on that? But you can see optimization, it's always the same process. Where the differences arise are, of course, with your diagram and the equations that you make from those diagrams. But once you have those equations, you always do the same thing. Solve for one variable in your constraint, plug it into the objective, differentiate to find the max or the min. Right? And at the end of the day, you answer whatever question you're specifically asked for. So if I ask for dimensions, that would be the answer. If they ask me for cost, this would be the answer. Right? So the final step can be different based on what they ask for. But the process overall, it's, it's always the same. It always goes through those six steps that I gave you in the handout. These kind of shapes, boxes, rectangles, cylinders. Uh, so cones, I, I don't think I'd ask about a cone. I think there was one formula, there was one file that asked about a cone, but I wouldn't ask about a cone. So boxes, cylinders, and rectangles? Yes. Is there a general logic that follows the, uh, the optimization of space? Like, um, Generally, a circle has a larger area than a square that has the same dimensions, right? Um, and so, generally, the four-sided shape of a rectangle will, uh, square will be the maximum enclosure of a rectangle. Well, it depends. Are you considering radius or, or length? But no, like those, those aren't rules that you'd have to have in your head. Like the calculus will work itself out. Right, right. It's not something you have to worry about. But it seems to always be pointing to a, a kind of a, a truth. Capital. Yeah, probably. But it's not something I think you'd have to worry about. Like you do fine without considering that at all. Like we didn't need to consider that. How did this volume of this rectangle compare to the volume of a cylinder of the same height? <laughs> like we never had to think of that idea to solve anything. It's just it wouldn't be worth your time to look up those rules. Well, that's how this this stuff transcends the classroom. Yeah, but for for now we we don't need that. Okay. That'll be another. In other cases, that might be relevant. It's not relevant for us. But if you want to do something theoretical, we can right now. It's going to be like that kind of theoretical. <laughs> so we've pretty much finished what we want to talk about the derivatives. We're going to talk about the other star of calculus now, the integral. We want section 5.1. The integral and antiderivatives. Um, before we begin, I just want to give you a definition because I want to be able to use this terminology. So notice this definition. A function big F of X is called the antiderivative of some other function, small f of X. These are standard notation to use. If the following is true, if F prime of X is equal to little f of X. So for example, I shouldn't use the word the here, because it's actually not unique. It's called an antiderivative. Each function can have many, many antiderivatives. So I'm going to give you an example. An example is um, x squared is the antiderivative of 2x, since if I differentiate x squared, the result is 2x. 
So you can think of antiderivative as kind of reversing a derivative. So if I undid the derivative of this guy, I would get that guy. It's called the antiderivative. You know, I take the antiderivative of 2x, I get x squared. Um, another, another example, x squared plus 5 is an antiderivative of 2x. Right? Since if I differentiate x squared plus 5, the result is again 2x. Right? There are many functions I can take to get the derivative of 2x. Right? In general, the function y equals x squared plus c, where c is any constant, is the antiderivative. So if I take the antiderivative of 2x, the answer is going to be x squared plus c. All functions of this form, when I differentiate them, I get that function. Okay. So that's called an antiderivative. Right. So for example, I could say that your position function is the antiderivative of your velocity function. Right? Your acceleration function, your velocity function is the antiderivative of your acceleration function. Right? I can go the opposite direction. Right. So if I have S of t equals position, V of t equals velocity, A of t equals acceleration. We already know that to go down in this list, I differentiate, I take derivatives. All right? This guy's a derivative of that, this guy's a derivative of that. To go in the opposite direction, I take what's called the antiderivative. Right? So if I take the antiderivative of this, I get that. Antiderivative of this gives me that. It's like going backwards from the derivative. So that's a terminology that I would like you to know. So later on when I say the general truth, I get that. Wow. <laughs> okay. So that's an antiderivative, right? What is the function that I differentiated to get this function? It's called the antiderivative. Okay. That being said, let's look at an idea. Let's say, let's go back to position. Let's say my position function is 3t, right? This is a position function. Um, t is time in, let's say, hours, or whatever state you are. So if I drew this position function, right, it would look like this. So this is s of t equals 3t, this is s of t, this is time in hours. I can consider this up to any point, but let's say I consider it up to 3 hours, between 0 and 3 hours. Okay, everything so far. Nothing, nothing, nothing scary so far, that's just a normal position function. No one be scared. Right, so this, and let's say S of t is in miles or something like that. So what does it say? When, after one hour, how many miles would I travel? Three. Three, right? After two hours, how many miles would I have traveled? Six. Six. And after three hours, nine. I would have traveled nine miles, right? So I'm moving at a speed where this is how, many, how, how, how far I've moved after a certain amount of time. Okay, that's cool. Um, now what is V of t? Right, my v of t is 3, right? Just the derivative of this guy. So that's the speed I would have to be moving, right? 3 miles per hour, right? So after one hour, <laughs> 3 miles. Now I remember that YouTube video again. Okay. Um, so what would that function look like? It's a straight line at 3. What do you mean a straight line? Horizontal, right? So at 3, there's a horizontal line, right? I have a constant velocity of 3. Okay. So far, so good. Again, let's consider this between 0 and 3. OK, now here's going to be some questions. And you're going to wonder, why am I asking these questions? I bet we are. 
Huh? Okay. So here's my question. Um, what is the distance traveled? between t equals 1 and t equals 3. Right? If I start measuring the distance I traveled between 1 hour and 3 hours, how far would I have driven? 6, right? How do I know? Well, I take find my distance that I've reached at 3 and subtract the distance that I already covered after I've been at 1. This will be 9. That would be 3. So six miles would be the total, right? Which here you can see. Between one hour and three hours, I traveled from three, a position of three to a position of nine. So the distance I covered was six. Okay. So that was the first question. Here's another question. What is the area under velocity between T equals 1 and T equals 3. Right? So go to this velocity function, find 1 and 3, right? What's the area of this portion? So the area here would be 2 times 3, right? Length times height, which is 6. Coincidence? How are they both six? <laughs> Does that always work? What if this wasn't a straight line? Would it still have worked? Is it a coincidence? I think not. It's not a coincidence. It turns out that's generally true. Note the area under V of t on the interval 1 to 3 was actually equal to the position at 3 minus the position at 1. Somehow knowing about the area under my velocity function told me about my position function. And it wasn't a coincidence. Turns out, this is true in general. In other words, now I'm going to use that language that I was introducing to you before. The area under some function f of x on an interval a, b is actually going to be equal to its antiderivative at b minus its antiderivative evaluated at a, right? Notice that my position function was the antiderivative of my velocity function. If I take the area of this function on some interval, it's exactly the same as evaluating its antiderivative at the endpoints of that interval. What I just told you in a very long-winded way was the fundamental theorem of calculus. But it's something that you kind of notice with all these other things. And this is true in general in any interpretation. So for example, if I find the area under the marginal cost function, it will actually give me the cost between I spend, how much money I spend between this point and that point. Right? I can figure that out by looking at the area under the marginal cost function. Right? For any function, if I take the area under its derivative, I can use its antiderivative to figure out that area. Right? Or usually what I'd like to find is this. I'd like to answer this question. How, how far have I traveled, right? But then I can answer that question by looking at an area, right? So, finding areas is important. For this and other reasons, of course. There are tons of reasons why you might want to find the area. Okay. 
right? So you, if you have a plot of land, you want to know how much land you actually own. Odds are it's not going to be a perfect rectangle where you can be like, oh, I own this much land. Let's take the length of my land by the width of my land. No, your land is going to be this weird thing that you're going to want to know how to find the area of, right? We're often going to want to know how to find the area of something. And these things might have weird shapes. Right? So given um, f of x, right? so a random function. Boom, f of x. I can ask the question, what is the area under this curve between a and b? What is this area? Now, as I said, based on the interpretation of what this function means, like position or marginal cost or something else, the area actually gives us a tangible answer. Right? There's a reason why that answer would be important. This leads to what's called the area problem. There are too many problems that, there are two problems, not too many problems, there might be too many. There are two main problems that calculus seeks to answer. The rate problem, how fast something is moving. You solve that problem with the derivative, right? The derivative tells you how fast something is moving. The next problem is the area problem, and you solve that with something you call an integral, right? Which turns out to be an antiderivative, as we're going to figure out. It took hundreds of years to figure that out. It's not a, it's not a trivial fact. Um, and we're going to be doing it in like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so the area problem is going to be a very important problem. How do you find the area of something, right? Some random curve, right? Um, if your function is nice, like a triangle or a rectangle, no problem. But what about it's something else, right? Then it becomes a, a little bit of a problem. So uh, it's like a weird, like, F shaped curve with with your starting number on the top and your bottom number on the bottom yeah. and then your function in a dx at the end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we're going to we're going to try to figure that out. And so what do we do with math when we want to figure out something new? Use something simpler that we already know how to find the area of and somehow build up. Exactly. That's that's exactly how math builds on each other. Right? This is kind of why conceptually if you want to get good at a math class, the point is to get good at the simple stuff, the basic rules. Because once you have those, you can build on them, right? So it's the same way, how did we figure out the error of a circle, right? It turns out, if you looked at the proof for the error of a circle, they start by knowing the error of a rectangle. And then they use that to figure out the error of a parallelogram. Then they use that to say, well, if we slice up this circle into a bunch of pizza slices and rearrange them, they kind of look like a parallelogram. And then you apply that logic to figure out, oh, the error is pi r squared. Right? So if you look at that, that's what's going to happen. And we're going to do something very similar here. I don't know what the error under this random curve is, but I do know the error of a rectangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to use rectangles in the beginning to approximate area. So the idea is, given a random function between A and B, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to dissect this guy into rectangles. Those guys I know the area of, right? Length times width, right? Now, obviously, it's not going to be exactly the answer, right? You notice that there are some gaps here. But exactly, if I use more rectangles, I close, I get rid of some of those gaps, right? And the more rectangles I use, the, the, piece, the more gaps I fill in, right? Obviously, in theory, if I could do an infinite number of rectangles, I'd fill in all the gaps and I'd get the exact area under the curve. That's where we're going. But this is where, how we start, right? Figure out how to find the area of these rectangles. And the area of those rectangles is an approximation of the area under the curve. So the idea is the sum of the areas of the rectangles is approximately the area under the curve. The more rectangles we use means the better our approximation is.
Okay. So for now what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out the area using a finite number of rectangles to approximate an area. So here's how we're going to do the setup. I'm going to cut A and B into what's called subintervals. Right, so each guy here, this is called a subinterval. Right. And this, this, and the distance between each subinterval, the length here, I'm going to call it delta x. It's the change in some x value. And they're all going to be, for simplicity, I'm going to make them all the same width. They're all delta x. Right. So the idea is. So my interval is going to look like this. Here's my a, which I'm going to call x0 or x0. Here's my b, which I'm going to call xn. And I'm using n rectangles. So this would be my x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn. And the distance between each of these x values is delta x. Could you give me a formula for delta x based on this idea? X plus one plus two minus x. I have this length. I want to chop it up into n pieces. What's the size of all the pieces? B minus a divided by n. B minus a over n, right? The length of this is b minus a, right minus left gives me the length. And I'm chopping it up into n pieces. Mm -hmm. So the length of each piece is going to be b minus a over n. It's the length of the whole interval divided by how many sections I'm chopping it into. That's going to be the length of each part. Right? This is a formula that you should remember. Okay? That, by the way, is going to be the width of our rectangles. So I, I developed a concept that I call delta x, the change in the x values. That is defined to be the width of my rectangles. It will always be given by this formula, b minus a over n. Take the final endpoint minus the initial endpoint, divided by how many subintervals you want or how many rectangles you're constructing. That will give you the width of all the rectangles. How, many, how um, do you know what the n is? They'll tell you. Oh. So we'll tell you. So the question will say, use four rectangles to approximate the area. Or use four subintervals to approximate the area. So I'm going to give you a number. Um, in the other calculus, you'll, you'll figure out how to take a limit as n goes to infinity to find the exact one, but we, we skip that here. Um, so yeah, that's the width. How would I figure out the heights? Hmm. Same thing, So here's my rectangle, A and B. I know the width of each of these guys is delta x that we've discovered, and I know exactly how to find that, right? But what if I said something like this? So here's my x0, here's my x1, x2, x3, x4, and b in this case would be x5. And let's say I choose the point that the right side here is going to give me the height of this rectangle. Where my lines intersect the right side gives me the height. Can you tell me the, the, the heights? Yeah, it's right. For the this first one here, the area is going to be f of x one would give me the height. Right. For this one, f of x two would give me the height, and so on and so forth. Right? So in other words, f of xi equals the height of the rectangle. That's 
basically. So I set up my rectangles. Evaluating my function at particular x values can give me the height of my rectangle. This is how I find the width of my rectangle. Which means the area of each rectangle looks like what? F evaluated at some x value times delta x. Right? This is just the height times the width. Now the question is, how do we choose these x values? If you're going to an infinite number of rectangles, it really doesn't matter. But we're only using finite amounts. So the short answer is, they're going to tell you exactly how you choose them. Common ways. One is called using right hand endpoints. Um, this is referred to as R little n in your textbook. So if they say R4, they mean use four rectangles with the right side determining the height. And the L left side would be L n. Yeah. So you could also use the left hand end point. <coughs> um, this is basically L n. Third, another common way is using midpoints. And then. Which your textbook would refer to as M N. So um, let me show you the differences between the two, between the three. And then hopefully we get through one example or so. And we will pick up to get up tomorrow. So let's say I'm using, in this case, four sub examples. So here's my function. I'm here, A, B, and I'm cutting this into four sections. Right? Now if someone says, use R4, right? meaning use the right hand endpoints with four subintervals, what's going to happen is, here's my A, Here's my B, it's cut into four sections. The height is determined on each interval by the right side. Right, so I'm gonna go here on the right, that's where the height is determined by. Here, the right side is where the height is determined by. Here, the right side is where the height is determined by. Here, the right side determines the height. I could also do another case. I could say, what is L for for this function? means on this interval, I use the left side to determine the height. So it's where the, the left side touches the function, that's my height. This interval, where the left side touches the function, that's my height. This interval, where the left side touches the function, that's my height. This interval, where the left side touches the function, that's my height. I could also do M4. I have my function, here's A, here's B, cut it into four sections. Now in each interval, I'm going to find the middle of that interval, the midpoint. That's going to be the height. So these are very three very common ways to, to find the height of our rectangles. Now when you notice what's happening here, for this particular curve, it, it'll be different for each one. 
Is your R4 going to give you a bigger or smaller answer than the actual answer? Yeah, bigger. Bigger, right? Notice that in this case, R4 gives you an overestimate. Whatever answer you get using R4 will give you larger than the actual number is. L4 clearly gives you an underestimate, mm -hmm. right? So you're clearly missing some area here. So that will actually give you a smaller answer than the actual area. M4, in this case, tries to remedy that. In some cases, it takes a little bit bigger and then takes a little bit less on that side. So it kind of balances out, right? So depending on your function, if my function was actually decreasing, the exact opposite would happen. This would give me an underestimate, that would give me an overestimate, and this would kind of be somewhere in the middle. And your function could be a combination of these two, right? So it's not always overestimate, underestimate. It depends on the picture, right? But this is um, three main ways that we used to find um, the heights of our functions, right? Depending on what x value we want to plug in, if you want to plug in on the right side or the left side or the middle. Right? So, here. Hence, we have this idea. Our area under our curve is going to be roughly the same as our function at some x value times delta x, right? That's height times width, plus the function at some other x value times delta x, plus, right? So I'll give you a problem. Approximate the area under this curve using the right hand endpoint and four subintervals. intervals, right? I'll give you that information. So you'll know which one you want to use. And of course, when I take the height times the width for all of these guys, um, that will give me my approximation. The right hand side of this, the right hand side, This thing here, this expression here, is called a Riemann sum. <laughs> this guy inside. Obviously, some of us are familiar with a Riemann sum. Yes. Yeah. Right, it's named after a German mathematician, Bernard Riemann, which studied under the legendary mathematician Paul Friedrich Gauss. Gauss, which was smarter than all of us are in math by the time he was four years old. <laughs> it's a good hypothesis. <laughs> Including me, I'm not even. I'm not even kidding. Uh, Gauss is the name of the mathematician. Right? When he was four years old, he was figuring things out that people many years older than him couldn't figure out. Um, so. So yeah, it's called a Riemann sum, right? So let's actually, you know. Nope. No PlayStation 2, nope. no iPhones, no Pokemon Go, just math. Yeah. There's a story how when he was in kindergarten, his teacher gave them, to keep the class quiet, she gave them the, um, the task to add all the numbers from 1 to 1,000. 100, I think it was. I, I don't know. It's, it's a big number. Yeah. For kindergartners, it would take forever. And, he did it in like a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he figured out a formula how to add the first n numbers. Right? So you have one plus two plus a thousand. He figured out, well, what if I took the numbers in the opposite order? Right? Notice that what you would get is 
You add these, you get a thousand and one. You add these, you get a thousand and one again. You add these, you get a thousand and one. You add the last one, you get a thousand and one. You get all the thousand and ones. But how many numbers were there? A thousand numbers. So the sum is just a thousand times a thousand and one. Well, you added the list of numbers twice, so you divide by two. That's the answer. That's why you add a thousand numbers. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so he did that, and he's like, yeah, I added all the numbers. Everyone else is there, like, one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is two. Yes. No. That's how a mathematician adds numbers. How like that? And it actually works in general. So you, the first million numbers is not any harder. You can go up to n. These would always give you n plus one when you add them together. And so the final answer is always going to be n times n plus 1 over 2, no matter what it is. At the first million number, substitute a million here. At the first billion number, substitute a million. It's a odd number. It changes your formula, right? No, same formula. It's an odd number? Yeah. Because either this number or this number will be even. You'll always be able to divide 2 into one of them. So if this is even, that's odd, you divide the 2 into this. If this is odd, that would be even. Divide the two into that. It'll work no matter what. Like no matter what, this is the way to do it. <laughs> anyway, here's the example of a problem. How it might look. So I might say approximate the area under f of x equals x squared plus one using four subintervals and right hand intervals. It's a lot easier than I made the theory seem. Like once you figure out the theory, it's, it's not going to be bad. And the good thing is, this is another one where I'm not going to be creative in how I ask the question. I'm literally going to ask you like this. Approximately they're under blah, using blah, and here I'm going to either say right, left, or midpoint. I'm literally sub I'm going to swap this out, I'm going to swap this out, and I'm going to swap that out. But the question is going to look pretty much like this. Right? So that's the example of my problem. So here, remember what this, this, fun this function actually looks kind of like what I was doing before. Um, I have to give you the interval as well. Um, the interval. Um, let's say one to five to make it interesting. Okay. So here I'm at one, here I'm at five. I want you to approximate the area between those two points under this curve using four subintervals. Right. So using four subintervals means I'm going to split this guy into four. Right. And then the right side is what I'm going to use. Now the question is, what is my delta x here? One. Right, delta x is b minus a over n. b is five, a is one, n is four. So this is literally one. Which means the length of each of these is one, right? In which case, I can figure out these x values, right? What would be this x value? Yeah. Two, and then three, and then four, right? So I know I start at 1, and I move in a distance 1 each time until I get to the end. Right? So those will be the numbers. Right? So I'm on the interval. So this is my interval now. 1 to 5. I have 2, 3, 4. Now if I'm taking the right-hand endpoints, what are the x values that I care about? The 2, the 3, the 4, and the 5. These guys. Right? On each interval, I'm taking the number on the right side. When I move to this interval, I take the 3. Move to this interval, I take the 4. Move to this interval, I take the 5. I'm going to ignore the 1 because the 1 is on the left, right? And I'm taking the right. So these are going to be the guys that I'm going to evaluate my function on. So my A is literally going to be delta x times f evaluated at 2 plus f evaluated at 3 plus f evaluated at 4 plus f evaluated at 5. Right? So this is the width times the height times the height times the height. So my delta x is 1. 
my area is going to be approximate. So my area, I mean, I don't really care if you My area is going to approximately equal to R4, which is equal to this. So what is f of 2? I'm just going to plug in 2 into that function. Right? So that's 2 squared plus 1 plus 3 squared plus 1 plus 4 squared plus 1 plus 5 squared plus 1. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, that's 4, plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25. And yeah, you add those up. Usually the, the function will be something where they might say, it's OK to leave your answer as a sum of numbers, in which case you'd stop here. Right? But for something like this, you just add them up. Right? So that area would actually be what? Wait, it's 4 plus 4 plus 9? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is it crazy? You took the ones out the of The ones? Them. There are four ones. So that gives me the 4. And then 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25. Why do you shift to the right one to get 5? To, why do you include the 5? <coughs> why don't we include the 5? Why did you in the f of 5? Because it's right and puts. So because you're shifting to the right to get four in there, you go one over. And no, that's not how you look at it. On your interval, right? You have one to five. You cut it into four sections, right? Oh, okay. I then it. on I each it. section, you look who's the number on the right side. Nice. So in, on this section, two is on the right. On this section, three is on the right. This section, four is on the right. This section, five is on the right. Right. So these are your numbers: two, three, four, and five. So this was what? 58. Yeah. Right? Now notice that will actually be bigger than the actual answer. Right? But it's an approximation, right? And that's with four. So I would want to actually push this something that is to infinity. Oh, we'll talk about that next time, right? Okay. Um, give me your rules and I'm sure the theory was scary, but then when you when you actually do this problem, it's, it's not. Yeah, a, it's yeah, not I'm a like, what is? <laughs>